right, so I guess we'll get started uh, on the best topic you will ever be lectured on, which is diabetic retinopathy. I think it's really fun to treat diabetic retinopathy because it's so diverse and it's kind of presentation, it's phenotype, and also it's severity and um, how we can treat it. So, it's the most, so diabetic retinopathy is most common in type 1 with 40% of patients developing it versus uh, type 2 is 20%. And notably, it's the most common or most prevalent cause of legal blindness between the ages of 20 and 65 in the United States. I think it's a really important thing to consider because that's working age people who are trying to raise children. And so protecting their vision is particularly important to society. The risk factors are the duration of having diabetes. So after 20 years, 99% of type 1 patients and 60% of type 2 patients have some degree of diabetic retinopathy. Uh, for type 1, at 20 years, 50% will have PDR. And at 25 years, 25% will have PDR, which is really remarkable. Um, the risk factors are poor metabolic control, things that may be uh, or are complicating factors are pregnancy, high blood pressure, kidney disease, obesity, hyperlipidemia, and anemia. So the general pathogenesis is that there's different factors that cause endothelial cell and pericyte damage. This leads to an increased platelet adhesion, increased erythrocyte aggregation, abnormal lipid levels, upregulation of VEGF, uh, general abnormal viscosity of the blood, inflammation, defective clot breakdown, and then ab abnormal levels of growth hormone. This is a, clearly a complex milieu of inflammation and ischemia that uh, leads to this thing we call diabetic retinopathy. It really is a microangiography. It's most characteristic problem is that there's a loss of the pericytes and that leads to a proliferation of endothelial cells. There's a thickening of the basement membrane and that's causing ischemia. The microvascular occlusion leads to a number of things. Early on it leads to AV shunting which is IRMA, so intraretinal microvascular abnormality. And then eventually it leads to neovascularization, which are new blood vessels that form on the retina optic disc and the iris. And it's thought to be caused by the angiogenic factors from retinal ischemia or the release of VEGF. Vision loss from diabetic retinopathy um, really can be broken down to two main problems. You have leakage from the blood vessels, or you can have just a lack of blood flow. So the leakage from blood vessels leads to things like macular edema. And then the capillary occlusion causes macular ischemia, so that can just be uh, long-term vision loss because of poor perfusion in the macula. Or things like diabetic papillopathy, or the sequela when you have neovascularization, so vitreous hemorrhage, tractional retinal detachment, and neovascular glaucoma. It's a great photo just showing proliferative diabetic retinopathy in the boat hemorrhage. Now the classification of diabetic retinopathy is for non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy or PDR. It could be mild, moderate, severe, or very severe. And then for proliferative diabetic retinopathy, the two classifications are low risk or high risk. And we'll go through those. So in MPDR, microvascular changes um, are limited to the confines of the retina and never extend beyond the ILM. The characteristic early find is microaneurysms. And this moves on to dot bot hemorrhages with retinal edema, heart exudates. <coughs> Eventually, you get dilation and bleeding, beating of the retinal vessels. Um, you can get the formation of IRMA, which is a lot like neovascularization, but it doesn't break through the ILM. 
And then you, you can also have RFNL, infarcts of cotton wool spots, and capillary non-perfusion. And as we talked about, the way that this causes vision loss is twofold. One is macular ischemia, so that's capillary closure. And then the other is macular edema, and that's this capillary hyperpermeability. So the leakage we see leading to intraretinal fluid. So to classify NPDR, you've got mild, which are just MAs. You've got moderate, which are MAs and dot blot hemorrhages, um, but less than 20 per field, so the four quadrants. Severe has the 421 rule, so any of these will get you severe diabetic retinopathy, non proliferative diabetic retinopathy. And that's four quadrants of diffuse MAs or dot blot hemorrhages, so that's greater than 20 of these in the quadrant. Or if you have two quadrants of venous beating, or one quadrant of Irma. In terms of very severe, it's just if you have two of the three that you see in severe. Um, the reason this matters, and we'll see this in some of the results of the studies, is it is predictive of severe vision loss in these patients. This is definitely OCAP's stuff, and it's on it every year. Now, macular edema uh, has a number of names uh, that you'll see in the chart. And so the, from the ETDRS, you have clinically significant macular edema, and we're going to talk about this criteria in a second. You also have something called center-involving macular edema. So that's edema or thickening by OCT of the fovea. And um, it's important to make this distinction because center-involving macular edema has been criteria used for more modern clinical trials where we have OCT available versus the early work was done just by fundoscopy, and that was where the term CSME came from. Focal macular edema is a good term to use when there's a focal area of leakage, so you have an ex, you know, ring deck to say around a templar area of microaneurysms. Um, and then diffuse macular edema is extensive leakage, and that's widespread breakdown of the blood retina barrier. So as um, it's become very common in, in a huge part of retina practice is treating macular edema. And we can do that with a number of treatments. Most commonly, what's used in clinic now is anti VEGF treatment. And there are a number of options. Um, pretty much, we use three of these options at, today in ranibizumab, bevacizumab, and aflibercept. But the original trial was on pegatinib, which is macugen. And it really didn't have. Um, that high of a binding affinity with VEGF, and it wasn't as effective as these later treatments that we have now. But it was the first one to sh that was published to show that that um, mechanism could be worked to treat macular edema. In addition to anti-VEGF, we can use steroids. And the three approved options are the intravitreal tramcinolone or triessence, um, Ozerdex, which is a dexamethasone implant and then the fluosinonide implant, which is alluvian. Um, the reason that there are differences in uh, how we use steroids versus anti-VEGF is the risk profile within the eye, with steroids causing cataract and glaucoma, um, or elevated pressure in the eye, so they can be very effective treatment, but they do have a slightly increased risk profile in terms of if we're not going to use pharmacologic treatment, a treatment for macular edema is focal and grid laser. And before we had these injections, that was all we had, uh, which is before I ever did it. So it's all Dr. Teske had. And um, while this can be very effective even today with focal macular edema outside of the fovea, focal laser at the end of the day is de destructive. And we don't think of the pharmacologic options we have as being destructive. So 
oftentimes we use it in directed cases that are amenable to it. But we are in, a, in the last few years in a time where lasers making a comeback in the form of this micropulse laser or endpoint management laser by the Pascal system, which is the idea of laser that's subthreshold. Typically when we do laser, we like to see an effect. So you can see light blanching in the macula. Um, what we're doing, or what some companies are doing now, and there's some evidence to say that it works, is to essentially get that light blanching and then cut it to 20 or 30% of that and treat in a grid pattern throughout the macula and you can potentially uh, decrease your dependence on injections. So moving on to proliferative diabetic retinopathy, um, there's different areas of the retina or the eye that can neovascularize or convert to proliferation. And so we break them down um, into these terms and we almost always just use the acronym. So there, you have neovascularization of the disc, you can have neovascularization elsewhere, which is just on the retina, one disc diameter away from the disc. You have neovascularization in the front of the eye, the iris and the angle. So those are just the terms to know um, since we normally just write down those three letters. So what is proliferative diabetic retinopathy? So it's extra retinal fibrovascular proliferation that expands beyond the retina, so beyond the ILM, uh, with three stages of evolution. So first, uh, when in its earliest form, you can see new blood vessels forming with minimal fibrous tissue. And when we're saying fibrous tissue, we're saying you know, not red, it's white, it's scar. In this second stage, the new vessels increase in size and, and there's an increase in the fibrous component. And then in the third stage, the vessels regress, leaving residual fibrovascular proliferation along the posterior hyoid, and that can create traction, leading to, to detachment of the retina. So these are some great photos um, looking at these different forms. So I think this will have to zoom in a little bit. So in this upper right image, you can see that <coughs> there's neovascularization of the disc on this kind of super temporal quadrant of the disc. And while in the second picture, you can see there's kind of complete neovascularization of the disc, and then in this NVE with this fiber bat fibrous component. Moving down to this image, this beautiful area, you know, I guess neovascularization isn't beautiful, but it, when you look at it, it can be really interesting to look at. And you can see this neovascularization elsewhere. So over this diameter away from the disc, coming off the arcade. And then in that more extensive neovascularization elsewhere. This is a really good photo showing that as these blood vessels that had formed coming off the arcades down here have now started regressing and there's really there's some active vessels here but it's created this fibrous band and um, that's creating traction and it's tenting the retina here and tenting the retina here which then moving on you can see that this is Neovascularization on the disc that has created a ring of traction, sometimes called wolf jaw fibrosis. And it's because the two arcades connect and then they close and they detach the macula. And you can see that this retina is detached, and the macula is detached. <coughs> the treatment of PDR. <coughs> is first and foremost, and for many, many years, um, is panretinal photocoagulation. It will, this is something to know for boards is that it's greater than 1,200 spots of a 500 micron spot size separated by a half burn width, which is, that was the initial treatment or um, protocol. Oftentimes now we're using 200 micron spot size, but in, not quite as hot as it used to be. But 
The idea here is that you're destroying the ischemic retina and the peripheral retina, which is not as valuable to the patient. And hopefully what you're causing is a decrease in oxygen demand of the total retina. So this diffuse microangiopathy that's preventing blood to come to the retina um, by sacrificing the, the large real estate of the peripheral retina, you can hopefully continue to perfuse the macula and decrease that secretion of inflammatory signals, one of which is VEGF. So that increases the oxygen tension in the eye and, um, and decrease, yeah, from decreased consumption of the, and increased perfusion. All these inflammatory mediators cause a vasoconstriction diffusely throughout the retina. And so as you improve that inflammatory milieu of the vitreous and the retina, you're actually gonna have increased perfusion. So it's not just that you're killing dead retina, you're actually hopefully increasing the blood flow to the healthy retina or the retina we're trying to maintain health. And so that's interesting. There's no difference in single versus multiple sessions uh, of PRP. That's, I think that, I know that's debated by different attendings. I had attendings that always did PRP, never more than 800 shots in multiple sessions due to the risk of contraction. Um, and then there's, but there is good evidence to say that you can do a full treatment of you know, 1,500, 1,800 spots in a treatment. Um, I think that's one of those things that, uh, like a lot of what we do, is you're going to manage risk based on that specific patient in front of you and kind of set their expectations of how much they can get done that day. Um, and you may be more incentivized to try to get a full treatment in than someone that has limited access to care or is unlikely to come back uh, versus someone that um, has shown that they can uh, follow up. What's very interesting is a couple of years ago, the protocol S from the DCRC net uh, was released, and that was a non inferiority trial of ranibizumab um, versus PRP, so Lucentis versus PRP. And there's been many papers that have come out afterwards because the trial did conclude that you could use ranibizumab as treatment for. Um, PDR, and that actually those patients, uh, when you did an area under the curve analysis, had an improved vision through a year, and then at two years, it pretty much regressed back to the mean. Um, is that that would create maybe an undue burden on patients um, and on providers <laughs> if we were to treat PDR with long, uh, for a lifetime of injections. And the big debate around this is, when you stop injecting the patients, what happens to the neovascularization? Does it come back or doesn't? Um, so that's still uh, a debated topic of how, how to use it, but certainly in a patient with macular edema and a neovascularization, that using uh, anti-VEGF alone will, will at least through two years make the neovascularization go away. And that's where that all came from, right? I mean, we treated macular edema. And in the past, you know, we, before we had anti-VEGF injections, you know, you'd have a patient with PDR that needed laser, but they had macular edema too. And it was like, well, you know, if you just do PRP in eyes that already have macular edema, most of those eyes, the, P, the DME worsens. So we would have to say, well, we got to dry up your macula first. The problem is we didn't have good ways of drying up the macula. You do sort of grids and focal and you kind of, wait and hope that it would dry up so you could start your PRP, but you often didn't have that much time. So, you know, the advent of anti-VEGF, you're kind of killing two birds with one stone, and you can control the proliferative retinopathy. At least in the short term, you can control it as you treat the macular edema. Whether, I think the jury's still out long term, whether the lack of PRP in these eyes is going to be an issue. There's increasing evidence that maybe it's not going to be, but I, I don't think we really know that yet. So. Absolutely. And a really interesting part of protocol S is um, many of these patients that were in the PRP arm presented with diabetic macular edema and received injections 
of ranibizumab for their macular edema, and it's, I think it's 38% of the patients. So this wasn't really a trial where you had PRP alone versus ranibizumab and that would then get rescued with PRP. It was patients who were treated for DME, and some of them got PRP as well. And so I think it was a pretty tough trial against ranibizumab um, to say that, because so many of the patients were going to get ranibizumab anyway, and to show non-inferiority and increased vision. It, it was a powerful study, but it absolutely that jury's out. Um, and that's what we just talked about. So PRP, and the reason that we I brought that point on, it said it's okay to do a full session of PRP um, on one visit, is that lasering the entire peripheral retina causes inflammation, and that can cause an exudative retinal detachment, and that inflammation in the eye can cause macular edema certainly to get worse. And they can have patients that maybe don't have CSME, so they may have a little bit of temporal intraretinal fluid, but then after you do PRP, then all of a sudden their central vision's gone down, and they think you've caused them permanent vision loss. And uh, so it's very important to know when you're talking to these patients that they are diabetic, they have a likelihood of getting macular edema, and if they have very mild macular edema, it may get much worse. And, um, yeah, the tough patients to manage are those that have excellent central vision because they have little or no macular edema, but they have significant proliferative disease. Now you, they need PRP. There's a good percentage of those eyes that are going to lose some vision through the course of treatment, and it takes a lot of educating the patient and making them understand what's happening. Um, it's not as much a problem now because we have anti-VEGF, but in the days when we had to manage everything with laser, you know, it's like, well, what do you do? You do a focal grid, maybe slowly start the PRP, but you were always at risk of flaring up the macular edema. So. Uh, there are a number of papers out, and it, it's not in, we're trying to focus on what's in your books. Um, there are a number of papers out on vitrectomy for macular edema um, in the cases of the top hyloid or in medically refractory, or so it's, patients that's macular edema doesn't respond to injections. And it, the data is fairly weak, and when they've done that analysis, it's, it doesn't support that that works. Um, but so we can move on to the surgical management of diabetic retinopathy. So this is what I think is super fun. Um, so the first indication is a non-clearing vitreous hemorrhage, uh, which is greater than one of it's kind of one to six months after uh, you've developed a vitreous hemorrhage. Certainly if there's a tractional retinal detachment involving or threatening the macula, absolutely if there's a combined regmatogenous tractional retinal detachment. Um, there are certain patients that you'll have that will have adequate PRP, um, but they just keep getting vitreous hemorrhages and they may clear, but You've had multiple vitreous hemorrhages and you just have not been able to get that eye under control. Um, so as you know, in clinic, it's the far anterior retina is somewhat difficult to laser and uh, you can have times where you can have very anterior uh, neovascularization and ischemia that's difficult to get at until you get them to the, to the operating room and can really do that peripheral. Uh, laser. So, and then another case would be if you have vitreous hemorrhage and then go slow glaucoma, you would want to remove that inciting problem, which are the red blood cells in the vitreous. And it is not uncommon to have a patient with neovascular glaucoma or NVI or MVA, and they also have a vitreous hemorrhage. So you can't do PRP and you can, or this, uh, and so you may need to take them to surgery to remove uh, vitreous, the blood, get them adequate laser. Some of this, the paradigms for this are, have changed because of the ability to, ability to use anti-VEGF agents. 
for instance, if we have someone come with neovascular glaucoma now and there's too much vitreous hemorrhage to um, get PRP, we'll often treat them with anti-VEGF to see if we can control that eye before we take them to surgery now, which is great. Um, operating on a hot eye with a pressure of 60 is difficult. Um, and the um, posterior highlights are the attachment between the vitreous and the retina, or the macula and diabetics is often very fibrous, so they get pretty impressive ERMs. And then if they bleed under these fibrous, taut posterior hyaloid, they can really be plastered on the macula in kind of a boat hemorrhage you see here. And that might dehemoglobinize and might begin to um, clear, but sometimes they just don't. So taking them, peeling that membrane off and clearing that blood will get their vision back for them. So we'll kind of go through the studies to know kind of the big works. Um, there's one that's not on here I always like to share when I talk about diabetic retinopathy because it was from the early 50s. And it was when, before we had any treatment or laser for the treatment of diabetic retinopathy for PDR. And so the neurosurgeons had come up with, and they were working with the retinologist at the time, um, that hypophysectomy, so removing the pituitary gland, may be a treatment for PDR. And so there was a trial where they went and they did neurosurgery and removed the pituitary gland to see if that would cause PDR to regress, and then, uh, it didn't work. So we've come a long way from chopping out sections of brain um, to, to be a little more focused since the, you know, 70 years ago. Um, so the first one is to look at is 1972, and I think it's just so impressive to look at how long ago some of these studies were now, and they're still really important to how we practice, which is the diabetic retinopathy study. And you have the diabetic, re diabetic retinopathy vitrectomy study in 1976, and the UK PDS in 1977, ETDRS 1979, the BCCT in 1983, and then many, many trials from the DCRC net, which are from a while ago to even going on right now. So the DRS study, the first one, 1972, um, and that is is the real question that they're asking, is PRP effective for the treatment of diabetic retinopathy? What they did was PRP to uh, one eye patients with advanced MPDR, PDR in both eyes. And then they looked at the rates of severe vision loss um, between the two eyes. And that was defined as visual acuity less than 5200 on two consecutive examinations, four months apart. And then compared to that control eye, did it not get PRP? And, um, and they were able to look at these patients for five years. So really impressive study of almost 2,000 patients. And what they found was that there's a greater than 50% reduction in the rate of severe vision loss. Um, as we talked about in the population we're looking at of um, people who are 20 to 65, severe vision loss can really be dramatically life-altering for them and their whole family, so uh, that was pretty amazing. I, I know there, Dr. Teske may know this, because there's a story about what laser they were using back then. Well, there were, it, the argon laser was relatively new, and it was argon blue-green, and then there was a xenon, okay. which was really a photocoagulator. It's not truly a laser, because it was a multiple wavelength. Oh, okay. and it would leave these, it, it was done with a, uh, a direct, big machine with a, a monocular direct view um, and the spots were about the size of the disc or bigger um, and they were I mean, massive spots when I first came here I mean there, there was an old xenon photocoagulator in a back room somewhere I don't know what happened to it but um, they all had to have a retrovolver block it was very painful but that was part they that was in the study this they were getting xenon or Uh, so the next study is the diabetic retinopathy study, and this is what defined high-risk PDR. So when you come and present to, a, and certainly it's on the board, just, um, you want to know if it's high-risk PDR or not. And that's defined as mild NVD with vitreous hemorrhage, 
hemorrhage and mild NVD would be less than a quarter to a third of a disc diameter. Um, or moderate to severe NVD, which is a quarter to a third disc diameter or bigger. Um, and, uh, uh, and that would be without vitreous hemorrhage. Or moderate NVE, so a half disc diameter or bigger with vitreous hemorrhage. And, um, and it says, or any of the three following. So that's always the three I remembered. So vitreous or pre-retinal bleeding, presence of neovascularization, um, disc ne neovascularization moderatism. Yeah, I think the top three are really what you want to know for OCAPs and boards. Um, what's really interesting about this, because this wasn't the neovascular glaucoma study, this was the diabetic retinopathy study, that they didn't look at NVI or NVA. We pretty much treat NVI and NVA automatically as if it's high risk PDR, if they have diabetic retinopathy. So this, put that one on your mind in the list, but when you answer the questions on the test, this, this is what you want to answer. Um, so next was the diabetic retinopathy, retinopathy vitrectomy study. So this is looking at severe vitreous hemorrhage. They wanted to answer the question is early vitrectomy, so within the first six months preferable to deferred vitrectomy for at least one year in eyes with severe vitreous hemorrhage from PDR or those without vitreous hemorrhage but very severe PDR. And what it showed is if you have type 1 diabetes, there was a clear benefit to doing early vitrectomy. And notice that early vitrectomy is defined as one to six months. So this isn't, this isn't tomorrow. This is you know, in the next month or so to see if this clears. Um, and then type 2 said no benefit from early vitrectomy for vitreous hemorrhage. Um, but if they had very severe PDR, early vitrectomy was beneficial. I think that this study is interesting. I'm not. I'm very curious if this was redone today with modern vitrectomy techniques. If yeah, we this is in the late 70s, and vitrectomy back then was, or mid 70s. This is a little different. So it was not uncommon to wait six months for vitreous hemorrhage to clear. Um, when they said there was no benefit to early vitrectomy, but these are eyes that would, I mean, in, in type two, but you also have an eye with no vision for six months or a year. But you know, this is when vitrectomy was 19 or 20 gauge. I mean, it was a it was a much riskier procedure per se than it is now. So, so uh, I think that this can, it, it's an important to know, but um, we're we're more aggressive than this. And I think if we repeated this study today, we would show early vitrectomy was probably beneficial to me. I think the main takeaway of this is that they did show that early vitrectomy is advisable in type 1 diabetics when they have hemorrhage. Mm -hmm. Sitting on these eyes for more than six months is not a good thing. So, whereas in type 2, it didn't seem to make much difference if you delayed vitrectomy. Their outcomes were similar. So. You know, it's a slight side note. I always film as a resident when you're in the emergency room and you have the diabetic who's never had an eye exam comes in, they're 60, they had flashes and floaters, they have a diffuse vitreous hemorrhage, you can't see the retina. Um, and, you're, and the other eye has you know, moderate, maybe severe NPDR. And you're sitting there asking yourself, do they have a tear because they just had a PVD? Or are they just diabetic with a vitreous hemorrhage because they're 60? Uh, you know, and then there's, so they've looked at studies where you did vitrectomy on every vitreous hemorrhage, even if you thought it was hemorrhagic PVD or anything, and it's 80% have tears. Um, but then if you have severe P diabetes, you know, it's always hard with late at night. So, you know, getting them to retina, you know, in the next couple of days is a good idea for us to look at it, get the ultrasound done. These are just awesome images showing high-risk PDR and some examples of things you want to be able to see. So let's uh, look at some of them. I think this one's great. Venus beating, when you see it, it's exciting because you've always memorized it, but you don't always see it. And this one's a really good example of Venus beating. So if you look at this inferior arcade, you can see this. Yeah, if you look at some of the, the, 
the standard photographs for Venus beating some of the early ones, they're not grossly obvious like that. Um, it can be more subtle than that. And, and on a exam, on a live patient, it can sometimes be difficult to see. It's always easier to classify a retinopathy looking at some photographs, right? You photograph the patient, you can look at them and stare at them as long as you want. In a live patient sometimes, and they're photophobic, it's not as easy to, to see all this stuff. But There's also clear NVD in this case. I, you know, and as you're looking at more and more eyes with NVD, you know, you'll see the shunt vessels in the CRVO patients, and so not every funky-looking blood vessel on the optic nerve head is um, NVD, and you'll get a sense, but typically they're very fine. They have a three-dimensional quality to them coming up off of the nerve, um, but it's, uh, it can be a little... So. So it's like it's the same patient. Um, and even on the projector, we can see what I think is really interesting here. So one, if you see an FA, like on the exam, and you see a dark spot like this with severe you know, retinal vascular disease, so you know this is blocking. If it's blocking, it's pre-retinal hemorrhage, and you, you know that this is going to be high-risk PDR. So, Blocking can be an indicator of, you know, on, you know, chest taking situation, of knowing that that's high risk. But I think what's uh, really interesting here is, so macula, is you can see the degree of capillary non-perfusion out here. I mean, there's just no capillaries, and of course the diffuse microaneurysms, and then the NVD is showing up as hyperfluorescent. This is probably the patient's other eye, and this is this so severe, it's, um, it's impressive. And then you can see these subhyoid hemorrhages, kind of mixture of age um, plastered on the retina. Let's see. Oh, that's so ETDRS study is a randomized clinical trial sponsored by the National Eye Institute. Three goals, compare early Photocoagulation versus deferral treatment in eyes with mild to severe NPDR or PD, early PDR with or without the amine. To evaluate the effect of photocoagulation for DME. And I wanted to look at aspirin would, cha would change the disease course of diabetic retinopathy. One of the things that gave us was the ETDRS um, chart which is the number of letters you can read on that chart, which has been, become standard for many ophthalmology studies since. Almost 4,000 eyes, 1980 to 85. So I was born in 84, so I was technically alive during this. Um, but I don't think any of the, oh yeah, I forgot we have one other old person. One, I'm one year over you. Yeah, all right. And so, and it, you know, looked at you know, the real the spectrum of mild MPDR all the way to PDR, and visual acuity had to be reasonable in each eye. One eye got photocoagulation, scatter, and or focal, and the other got none. And they got randomly assigned to aspirin or placebo. And this defined the 4-2-1 rule, and it defined clinically significant macular edema. Its findings were progression to, uh, the risk of progression to PDR. Um, it also found that early PRP reduced the risk of severe vision loss. And focal definitely improves visual outcomes and focal improves retinal thickness. So the reason these classifications are important is if you have severe MPDR over one year, there is a 15% chance that you're going to progress to high-risk PDR. So, sorry, so severe NPDR progressing to PDR. So when you see the 421 rule applied, a, a, know that that patient needs a different follow-up, and we'll go through what those follow-ups are, because you don't want to miss that conversion. I will say from personal experience, because um, when this was done, you know, by expert retina doctors and um, 
at the time not having some of the imaging modalities that we have now, that the, you know that golden age of fundoscopy was really there. And so, um, many patients that I think have severe NPDR or very severe NPDR, if you do a, a wide field angiogram, you'll be amazed the amount of NVE that's hiding in there that you just didn't quite see. Um, so it's, I think, something to think about when you see those patients as well. Very severe, so two of those criteria, it's almost 50% chance at one year. So when you see Irma and hemorrhages everywhere in a person with diabetes, know that they're, they're on that precipice and they might not always have macular edema, so they might be sitting there 2020 thinking they're fine, but they're really approaching that cliff of severe vision loss. So early scatter was not indicated in mild to moderate NPDR. The risk of laser outweighed potential prevention of severe vision loss. Um, so what is the risk of laser? So back then, certainly this was a hot laser. There were much there's a much higher incidence of things like exudative retinal detachment and severe macular edema that you then didn't have steroids or anti-VEGF to treat. Um, but the thing even now is there is visual field loss when you do PRP. And so um, taking someone with mild NPR and PDR doesn't uh, make sense. So we, we used to use this data a lot more um, before the hair of anti-VEGF and you know you had either eyes that had very severe MPDR you could certainly justify initiating PRP before they develop proliferative retinopathy because of their risk and again that partly depended on the individual the follow-up likelihood etc or if they already had PDR in one eye and the other eye had severe NPDR or very severe we would often initiate treatment in the fellow eye nowadays a lot of those eyes often have some macular edema um, there's certainly evidence that you can treat severe MPDR without macular edema now, just with anti-VEGF. So we don't, the, the idea of doing early PRP is probably not one we embrace anymore. You know, PRP is becoming less and less done, but um, back then, you know, we would treat eyes before PDR if they had um, pretty severe NPDR. And um, I think that's a great point. And there's been a number of recent studies, I think in Texas by the, um, Dave Brown and Charlie Wyckoff's group, where they've done wide field optos um, angiography on patients with DME and then the PRP directed at those areas of capillary non-perfusion in the peripheral retina to see if they could decrease the dependence on anti-VEGF injections. And they've all been negative so far. Um, so. But it's not uncommon to start trying things when you have patients that are refusing injections and they're still having you know, moderate to severe macular edema. And, and there's certainly case reports of it working, um, but in trials it hasn't worked out. So, and then early PRP resulted in mildly reduced severe vision loss. Yeah, so that's excellent. Um, I think my thought now as a fellow when I look at this is we're, before we were trying to decide is it worth it to do PRP uh, and these people uh, with either very severe NPDR or um, in a PDR. And now I wonder with the safety profile of vitrectomy now is really early vitrectomy and removing the hyaloid in some of these patients. Would that, if you have a 35 year old type one um, and I don't think that trial's been done yet, but it's the thing I think about now. Um, oh, and yeah, really importantly, the clinical definition of CSME. And this is, yeah, absolutely important to memorize. So it's thickening of the retina at or within 500 microns at the center of the macula. Heart exudates at or within 500 microns at the center of the macula. If it's associated with thickening of the adjacent retina. In a zone of thickening one disc area or larger, any part of which is within one disc diameter of the center of the macula. So those are the classic photos showing you those three different situations. So you have thickening within 500 microns of the center of the fovea. 
you have a one disc diameter area of thickening within one disc diameter of the fovea, and then hard exudate with adjacent thickening. So OCT is not around at this time, so this was all done with contact macular lenses. And uh, I think that's impressive. You know, when you get that perfect cornea and, you know, no cataract and you, you know, clear vitreous and you can see macular hematophilus, and then when you go and look, and you're like, oh, I can see it. And then you go look on the OCT and it's like massive. It's like 700 microns thick. Um, and but I think um, Dr. Teske and his colleagues were able to see pretty subtle things. That well, it's a little bit of a lost art because we don't spend the time putting that fundus lens on and doing biomicroscopy because we basically don't need to. We have OCTs now, and we have OCT-guided macular edema more than we do that. But that's good for historical purposes. And that was the criteria that was used. I mean, if you were going to treat somebody, they had to have, they had to meet one of those criteria before you would initiate treatment. And uh, so the focal results were, yeah, focal for CSME reduced the risk of moderate vision loss, which was doubling of the visual angle. Um, focal increased the chance of moderate visual gain, having the initial visual angle, and focal reduced retinal thickening. So focal works. So these are just good photos of focal. You can see the focal burns. And then you can see this grid. You see some of these patients that were in the TDRS that have lots of it, atrophy and lots of bigger spots. Um, early on in the criteria, if you were treating patients, you had to whiten all the microaneurysm. So you could have a spot over one, but if you could still see red in it, they sent it back and said you need to retreat that microaneurysm. And so you would treat it again until it whitened. So you would get these retreated areas and much heavier. So we'd never do that to the macula now, but that was part of the protocol back then. If, if the microaneurysms were not completely whitened, you had to retreat them. Wow. So. I feel I haven't done focal too many times, but I've done it enough, and I feel like if I get just any blanching of the retina, I'm getting yeah. And that this. involved we didn't follow. I mean that that change, even before the anti veg <coughs> drugs became available, our way of what we treated macular edema with laser evolved into much less treatment, mm -hmm. you know, much less heavier treatment, more just barely threshold burns. And a quick question. Yep. Um, so the focal grid on uh, the MAs necessarily, but you're just going you know, all the way around uh, the fovea? Well, are you asking me which one? Yeah, which one is it? Oh, well, they, there was a combination of both treatments. With, with GRID, when you weren't treating specific microaneurysms, mm -hmm. it's much lighter, smaller mm -hmm. spots. And that's probably why some threshold micropulse works. You know, you say, well, why does that work? You're not closing a microaneurysm. Mm -hmm. Well, it's probably some photochemical stimulation of the RPE and the pump mechanism, you know, however magically it works. but. So they saw that effect, you know, even in eyes that weren't, weren't, um, or had more treatment or that, I mean, that was kind of an incidental finding, you know, we thought you had to close specific microaneurysms. We found out, well, the eyes that had more microaneurysms that had more laser did better, you know, could be just anecdotally. So, well, they were basically getting a grid too. So it kind of evolved into light grids and then specifically trying to close microaneurysms. And then we kind of evolved and said, well, you don't actually have to whiten the microaneurysms to get the effectiveness. So we didn't treat as heavily anymore, but we would still target specific mic. It's really only practical now, honestly, in focal areas of edema where there's like a circinate area of macroedema, and you'll have a cluster of little microaneurysms within the edema, and then you can specifically target the microaneurysms, white them, and you'll get an effect. Um, but I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, but. thank you. So aspirin did not affect diabetic retinopathy but it prevents the patients from dying, so because it affects cardiovascular morbidity and mortality. So aspirin's a good thing, but it doesn't change the disease course in the eye. And it doesn't alter it either. That was the bottom line of that. So if somebody needs to be on aspirin for other reasons, they can be on aspirin. It doesn't have a negative effect on the outcome of the retinopathy either. So then there's the diabetes control and complications trial with that type one diabetics for one to five years. And if you can control their blood glucose, does it affect the progression of diabetic retinopathy? And it, the answer is resoundedly yes. So intensive control reduces the risk of development of diabetic retinopathy by 76%. It reduces the risk of progression by 54%. 
And then the other things, yeah, diabetic retina, or sorry, that diabetes really affects it, definitely has a disease modifying course on neuropathy and kidney disease. And it decreased patients' need for laser um, for treatment of their macular edema. So that's why every patient we see with diabetic retinopathy, it's important to help them control their blood glucose and communicate with their primary team. Uh, there was a similar study done for type 2 diabetics. This was done in the UK. And um, intensive blood sugar control reduces development and progression of diabetic retinopathy in this group as well. The DCRC net are multiple protocols uh, driven by clinicians, so by ophthalmologists who decide that these are real world questions we want answered. And they're not always questions that a drug company would want to sponsor to get answered. Um, and I think one of, the, you know, one of the very interesting trials in it. Um, so protocol B was the treatment of macular edema with either focal or the intravitreal transcinolone. And it showed that the visual acuity was better in triamcinolone. Um, <clears throat> but if you looked at four months, but if you looked at two years, the laser group outperformed them. Um, and there was less side effects. So this is really where we saw the side effect profile of cataracts and high IOP from intravitreal triamcinolone. Protocol I was the treatment of macular edema with Lucentis and prompt or deferred laser um, uh, with tramcellone with prompt laser. And ritabizumab with prompt or deferred, deferred laser was superior to laser or laser with tramcellone. So that's showing the beginning of the anti-VEGF era for diabetic retinopathy. Protocol T was comparing the effectiveness of a flibercept, bevacizumab, and ranibizumab. This is one I think is so interesting and important. It's similar to the CAT trial. Um, so, and it's hard to really have a randomized clinical trial comparing something that's uh, generic to branded medications. It's because of the money involved in putting on a trial like this. And uh, so I think this is a really impressive thing in our field that we're able to do this and show that <coughs> bevacizumab is reasonable treatment for DME, despite not being FDA approved, and despite not being supported by a company to do that. And so a similar effectiveness of all agents, um, but it's also important to note that a flibercept was more effective in patients with worse presenting vegetal acuity to 2050 or worse. So that's why at the VA, sometimes when you bring a new patient, we don't always do three of Avastin and then switch. There's reasons to start with ILEA, and it's okay to do that. And there's data to say that it's okay to do that. Protocol D was a case series of PPV with PVD creation for DME, and that showed that their uh, retinal thickening reduced the size, but there was not a significant difference in vision. Protocol P was patients with MPDR and cataract surgery, and it shows that post-operative CME is more common if you have NPDR. Um, so if when you're doing your pre-ops and if they have any NPDR, certainly if they have any macular edema, get retina on board, we'll give them anti-VEGF before, and then you probably wanna treat them with an NSAID and steroid to prevent Irvine gas. Protocol Q, patients with DME prior to cataract surgery, um, yeah, half of eyes had no visual acuity improvement or worsening of uh, the CME. So, or worsening with cataract extraction, sorry. Uh, any patient that doesn't have improved vision after cataract surgery and then afterwards has a problem that they may have had even before, they absolutely will associate it with their surgery. And so it's, in some patients you can educate around that. A lot of them, it's really d difficult to do that. So it's not standard of care in the U.S. to have an OCT on every um, 
pre-op cataract patient. But ERMs, DME, and people with mild DME that you might have just not seen on fundoscopy, or sorry, on diabetic retinopathy, you know, because of this, you really don't want to do cataract surgery on someone without at least talking about it beforehand and having everything in line. Protocol S, we already talked a little bit about. That was ranibizumab versus PRP for PDR. <coughs> and I, um, this was the other uh, result that I think is really important. There is a statistically significant decreased rate of vitrectomy in eyes that got anti-VEGF only versus uh, P the PRP group. Um, I, I think that's it's important to note. Um, you know, avoiding surgery is a good thing. So that's the recap of the studies. I can get a screenshot and send that out if anyone wants it. These are the examination schedule. First exams for type ones are five years post-diagnosis. Type two is at diagnosis, pregnancy, every trimester. Um, and then you can see there, it gets broken down by form and whether that they have CSME or not, or PDR or inactive PDR, how often they need to be seen. And so that's good to know, especially when we're at the VA. So any questions? I think we're pretty much on time. Um, I just wanted to share a quick case. Ooh, I don't know what just happened there. I just lost my screen. Treating diabetic retinopathy is, um, that's okay. uh, can be a challenge because it's kind of like, can be like weeding, that these patients are going to live a long time with this problem, and it can require multiple types of treatment over a long time. So. This was a patient of mine that uh, I met, a, I think, a year or so into her uh, once she started coming to see us at, uh, when I was a resident. So she had this pre-retinal hemorrhage and PDR in the left eye. Then a year later, she, after getting laser in the left eye and regression of that NVE, and she got lost to follow-up, she comes back, and now she has you know, another pre-retinal hemorrhage in the other eye. She gets PRP for that, um, disappears for a while, and she needed fill-in, she never got it. Uh, she now comes in with worsening, pre-retinal hemorrhage is in the left eye, and we do a lot more PRP, and we have regression of all these hemorrhages. Um, and we came in, and. Probably the details in the FA aren't as important as what I really want to show you here is we, you can tell that the, there's been regression of the preretinal hemorrhages. There's probably some NVE, and there's all this preretinal fibrosis kind of in both eyes. But when you do the wide field angiogram, you can see that diabetic retinopathy is really a diffuse vasculitis in some patients, and this one's a great example of it. And you're going to see how diffuse in both eyes the leakage is. And some of that leakage in those fibrovascular areas, even as it regress will still happen, but you can see it's pretty much everywhere. And um, she, at this point, had pretty good PRP, but she still has all this leakage. She now has macular edema, and she was one of those people who presented with 20-20 vision, and now she gets macular edema. Vision goes down 2040, 2050, and we started treating her with anti-VEGF and fill in PRP a year later and continue to do um, anti-VEGF. And after kind of six anti-VEGF treatments, you can see these late FAs images and she's had more fill in PRP that she, you really start to get more control of this diffuse vasculitis. And now we're looking, now we're four years after this all started, and she starts to kind of look like that. So she has these areas of pre-retinal fibrosis. She's got the laser in, she's got an ERM. She's 20-25 in this eye and 20-20 in this eye, and I can't see that image quite as well. And her FA is not terrible. And um, 
and that's when I kind of handed her off uh, when I came here. And so kind of when she was starting, she looked like this. This is what she looks like now. Sorry that that photo didn't show up. But diabetic retinopathy is, you know, for her, it's going to be a lifetime issue. Oftentimes with PDR, it does burn out. And there's patients I've seen with Dr. Teske where he did laser, you know, 15 years ago. And now they're sitting there with 20-20 vision and their macula looks pretty good and the peripheral retina has gone. But it's... Um, but it, it, you can stabilize these eyes, but oftentimes you're, this is a really long-term process for these patients. It makes it really fun to treat because you get to know the people really well. Um, but they, if they're having this in their eye, they're having other problems. And so it can be hard to get them to always follow up, but if you're gonna take care of them for 10 years, you'll get to know them. And uh, it's a fun disease to, to treat. So I think we all have to get the clinic. Thank uh you. -huh.